So welcome everyone to the History of Economic Society session on uh, women and the economics profession uh, after World War II, though actually uh, also including the interwar uh, period as, as well. Um, our first speaker is Edith Kuiper from uh, State University of New York at New Paltz, uh, speaking about Sadie Alexander and economics in the interwar period. Uh, we're going to have 20 minute presentation of each paper followed by 10 minutes for discussion. And uh, the presenters have a preference for questions to be held till after the presentation for the, the 10 minute discussion after each session. So uh, Edith, the floor is yours. If you will start, unmute yourself and start sharing your screen. Okay, thank you, Robert. Thank you, Robert uh, Dimal and and Marie May for organizing this session. Let me share my screen now. There it is, and there is my presentation. Okay, if it works, yes. Okay, mm -hmm. so uh, the long title uh, of my paper is um, Sadie T. M. Alexander and the race in, and race in interbellum U.S. economics. So, um, and thus this paper precedes the period under discussion here today. I hope that my paper will provide a bit of an introduction and also a bit of historical context for uh, the discussions about the post-war period. In my work in the history of economic thought and in my book, A History of Economics, that will come out in May, if I make a, may make a bit of advertisement here. I make a point of bringing in voices of women economic writers who did not have access to higher education and to academia and to economics in particular, but who did write about their economic experience, about their research and insights, and who I think deserve to be heard to get a full picture of economic history, but especially history of economic thought. So Sadie Alexander was one of these women. She was excluded from economics. Um, and I think she's one of the women that deserves to be heard as she has important things to say, which I hope to argue in this paper. Economics lost out by excluding her from the discourse is my uh, point. And it took decades for the topics that she wrote about to finally come to the table in economics. So Sadie Tanner Mossell Alexander was a remarkable woman. Born in 1898 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Sadie Tanner Mossell obtained both her BA and MA from the University of Pennsylvania, and her dissertation research resulted in the standard of living among 100 Negro migrant families in Philadelphia. And she obtained her doctorate degree in 1921 as the first black economist to do so. After an unsuccessful job search and a year at home as homemaker in 1924, Alexander decided to obtain a law degree. And she did so in 1927 as the first black woman at the Law School of Pennsylvania University. She would soon join the law firm of her husband and the firm then became um, uh, called Alexander and Alexander and the firm would become an important force in support of civil rights for African-Americans. Throughout her career, Sadie Alexander will then continue to research and engage in activism for the improvement of the rights of the economic status of black women and men. She was an appointee to the Commission of Human Rights by President Truman, President Kennedy, President Carter, only to be removed from the commission by Ronald Reagan in the early 80s. She remained active at the state level, chairing the Commission for Human Relations, and over her lifetime, she was president and legal advisor. There we go. Um, on the Black women sorority, Delta Sigma Theta. Okay, so these are, uh, 
I didn't cover all of her activities, but I think you get a fairly good impression of her active life. And she had been active until uh, her impressive age of 89. Okay. Julian Malveaux requested attention for the work of Alexander in 1991 in her article, Missed Opportunity. Sadie Tenemersel Alexander and the Economics Profession, published in the American Economic Review. Melvo concentrates on the doctorate research of Alexander. For this research, Alexander and her assistant had extensive interviews with Black families in Philadelphia about origin, where they came from, family structure, employment, state, employment status, income and expenditures, and ways the family used to make ends meet. So really they wanted to figure out, get a grip on how people got their income and spend it. What was their consumption patterns? And did they adjust to the uh, new environment that they uh, ended up in? It will take until 2021, however, uh, for a Alexander's um, other economic materials like lectures and speeches to get finally published through the work of Nina Banks of the University of Bucknell under the title Democracy, Race and Justice. The speeches and writings of Sadie T.M. Alexander, which is published by Yale University Press. And there you see Nina Banks. Okay, this book does a great job introducing, presenting, and presenting the work of Alexander, who made an important contribution to the civil rights movement and who was an intersectional feminist avant la lettre. So I re warmly recommend this book. Um, Nina Banks contributed a set of introductions in, uh, to the various fields of speeches uh, and lectures that Alexander uh, gave. In her speeches and lectures, Alexander provides a detailed overview of the economic state of African-American women at the bottom of the labor market, a topic scarcely investigated at the time and still under uh, researched today. African-American women had a tradition of being engaged in paid work, much more than white women. In 1910, what we see is that 54.7% of black women were engaged in paid work against 19.6% of white women. And in 1920, this had changed to 38.9 black women who were engaged in paid work against 16.1% of white women. You see that there is substantial, substantial uh, difference. But only a small part of these African-American women had industrial jobs, 3.4% in 1910 and 6.7% in 1920. <clears throat> Later in uh, the economic status of Negro women, an index to the Negro economic status, Alexander, who based her um, results on the 1930 census, indicates that for 1930, the percentage of African-American African-American women engaged in paid work had remained constant. So that is 38.9%. Of these women who were engaged in paid work, 62.6, so that is two thirds, had a job in personal and domestic service. This is an enormous amount. More than one, more than 25%, 26.9 to be exact, worked in agriculture, mostly in crop raising. The wages in these sectors remained low, often not more than $4 a week. Quote, a meager existence, unquote, concluded Alexander. The percentage of women employed in industrial jobs remained low at 5.5%, and these women did predominantly unskilled work in tobacco factories and to a lesser extent in food, textile, and wood factories. These sectors, especially the domestic sector, was hit hard during the depression. Right? The first uh, cuts in budget that people made was, was firing the help in the, house, uh, in the household. Alexander's, uh, Alexander warned in advance, um, she has a lecture about that, about the negative impact of the New Deal programs and that um, uh, these programs could have for black black workers. So we still 
kind of covering and, and commenting on economic developments concerning the black community. All right. Um, during this time, so let me talk a little bit about the context and about economics, what's going on there at the time. During the time that the Jim Crow, during this time, the Jim Crow laws were still very much in place, right? So um, Tana Mosell, when young, she received her high school education at M Street High School in Washington, DC. And this was a school for black youth who got educated about the history and contributions of black Americans to the American economy and society. I think this is rather exceptional. So, so from a young age onward, she gets this, this, this training in the history, in black history, so to say. Uh, after obtaining her PhD de degree, I already talked about that, there are no options for employment in economics. So her job search is unsuccessful. This was because as a black woman, she would have to teach at a black college, right? Uh, where she would, um, as a woman, face limited opportunities as well. So she was held back by being uh, a, black, a black person um, and by being a woman. So for, this made it effectively impossible for her to pursue a career in economics. Economics at the time was not only fully dominated by white men, the dominant perception about race and race relations was skewed against blacks. Thomas Leonard, um, I don't know if you're familiar with this, this work, but uh, he has written extensively about the role and impact of the increasing popularity of social Darwinist ideas of people like Herbert Spencer, who perceived race relations in terms of competition and survival of the fittest, and more importantly, eugenic ideas of Francis Galton and Carl Pearson. Eugenics claimed, backed up by statistics, which made it like a scientific approach, right? Um, it claimed that racial differences were predominantly biologically based and hereditary. So uh, scientific racism, the specific and increasingly dominant form of eugenics claimed based also on statistical data, the superiority of the white race, the inferiority of the black race, which would sh show in their consistent poverty, uh, they would be weak-minded, weak um, blacks would be prone to violence, they would be lazy, they would have bad health, being less strong, um, health-wise, etc., etc., etc. As Thomas Leonard's uh, article from 2005 in History of Political Economy states, um, um, quote, it is hard to overestimate the influence of Darwinism and eugenics in the progressive area, era. Sorry, I believe one cannot fully understand the economic ideas that underwrote labor and immigration reform without also understanding the biological thought that crucially informed them. Um, Leonard also makes the point that a particularly progressive and liberal economist both in the US and the UK were taken in by these ideas of social Darwinism, Darwinism and eugenics because they saw in these approaches and in the involvement of state policies that social ills such as poverty and unemployment could be dealt with by improving the race. Yes, and rooting out those who were considered unemployable. So for instance, Beatrice and Sidney Webb and other members of the Fabian Society, they sure share these views. Sherlock Perkins Gilman also talks about improvement of the race, the concerns about the stock, um, et cetera, et cetera. Also what Alfred Marshall applied these notions in his principles of economics. As said before, the government was considered to have an important role to play in putting regulations and other policies in place to effectuate the improvement of the race or the stock, which implied the protection of the dominance of the white race. 
there's a lot to talk about here, of course. Against this background, US economists debated about whether the Anglo-Saxon or white race was under attack and threatened to be run over by non-whites. That was a really, really concern at the time, especially among the elite and as Leonard says, among the progressives. Um, and they were concerned about um, the black Americans and um, they perceived um, black Americans as a threat. And that was one side of the debate. The other side of the debate was that uh, stated that African-Americans would become extinct due to the fact that they that they had that the black race was weak right that was the argument that was being made this latter idea the um, idea of the black disappearance hypothesis was propagated by quite a few economists that played a central role in u.s economists several of whom were actually president of the um, census and also and or president of the American Economic Association. So think about Francis Amasa Walker, uh, Walter Wilcox was really involved in those debates as was Irving, Irving Fisher. Okay. Um, at the time there were of course no black and or women economists in the room to contradict these ideas. Eugenics in this form died out for various reasons, but never really vanished from economic reasoning, taking the form of tacit assumptions. Sadie Alexander, active on civil rights issues, equal opportunity legislation, and education of black Americans, stayed away from these debates, which is not part of economics at the time, on nature and versus nurture, but she took a stand in her work where economist reasoning was mainly theory-based, Alexander worked with meso-level data on occupational segregation, employment, and consumption patterns of African-American households, where in her analysis of household behavior, she found confirmation of the angle curve. Most of her work addressed the macro level of the economy, where her economic theoretical approach was mostly along Keynesian lines a macroeconomic focus on the issue of wages, employment, demand, spending patterns, and investment in industrial sectors, and the development and impact of occupational segregation and government policies. Using available data from the census and other sources, including her own research, Alexander's theoretical work resulted from and contributed directly to her work as policy advisor, propagator, and activist. So her initial take on poverty and low wages, different from the uh, dominant um, narrative in the economics discipline. Three, three more minutes? Two more minutes? Three. Yeah. Three. three more minutes, well, I will, I will make that. So um, different from the dominant narrative in economics, uh, Alexander's um, initial take on poverty and low wages was to support educational support efforts, right? It's not the characteristics of black Americans uh, to be poor and to uh, have health issues, et cetera, et cetera, but it was a lack of education, a lack of economic support, et cetera. So education was important and she, she had the idea that when Americans would be better educated, opportunities would follow. So that is in the 1930s. In 1964, however, in her statement to the White House Regional Conference on Equal Employment Opportunity, Alexander states, quote, in spite of this educational improvement, the economic gap between Negroes and whites is becoming wider, unquote. According to her, this was caused by, quote, the long existence of discriminatory barriers that have traditionally barred such persons from the mainstream of employment. Government, industry, and labor as well must all reinforce their efforts to correct the situation, unquote. In closing, she presents a quite detailed program to achieve equal opportunity uh, to achieve equal opportunities for uh, Blacks at the labor market. Kind of nice uh, detail is that for her, for the, sorry, for the occasion of her third, 70th birthday, they gave a lunch in her honor. 
Sadie Alexander mentions a few words about that, but then dives on um, making suggestions for improvement for the functioning of the Pennsylvania Commission for Human Relations. She's constantly working, working, working to improve and come up with uh, policies, which, uh, and she was chairing this commission. Her work for the Human Rights Commission was broad in scope and innovative and visionary in its design. To have an administrative system set up to induce, put in place and monitor the progress made by industries in reforming their hiring and wage system is still radical in the sense that the current approach of the EEOC, Equal Employment Opportunity Committee, which is responding to individual complaints is much more passive than the system designed by Alexander and her co-workers. To close off, I would like to underscore the point made by Julianne Melvaux 30 years ago that economics lost out by excluding Sadie Alexander from the discipline. As we would have learned much sooner about the, and much more about the contributions of black Americans to the economy, the foundational role and impact and persistence of racism in the American economy and about the policies that can effectively bring about equal opportunities for all. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have uh, 10 minutes for uh, discussion and comments. Please use the raise hand function at the, the bottom of your screen and unmute yourself and I'll uh, collect a uh, few uh, comments uh, and then Edith can reply. Um, Okay, three participants raised their, their hands and they are not unfortunately show, all I can see is that there were people who raised their hands, but I cannot unfortunately see who they are. So Well, maybe they can speak up. Then you so can. I think just unmute yourself and uh, and speak. May I? I will start. Thank you so much uh, yep. for. I mean, this is a really interesting uh, 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 paper and presentation. And I was thinking about. Uh, I mean, you say something about uh, um, the consumption, and so the analysis of consumption. Mm -hmm. uh, could you please, I mean, tell us more because it's really interesting because I can see also some similarities with uh, women economies that used to work in the fifties mm -hmm. that used to look at consumption. That's something that we lost in in the in, the, in our profession. So. Uh, could you please tell me some more about her uh, interest and the study about that? And thank you so much. I also see hands yes. raised by okay. Anne Marie and Cleo. So if we can collect those three questions and then Edith can uh, respond to uh, the three of them as, uh, as a group. So Anne Marie next and, and then, then Cleo. Okay, thank you so much, um, Edith. I, I just was, I'm struck by how uh, challenging it is for um, women and in particular women of color in this profession in the early years. And one of the stories, um, maybe you came across this, but one of the stories that struck me a lot was when she went into law and then she had um, a friend who had applied to medical school at Penn and um, was rejected and um, they told her it was because of her race. And um, she said, was that rejection in, on letterhead? <laughs> was her first question. And then she went on to meet with the um, heads of the schools who decided that maybe that wasn't the right decision after all. And what she remarked in her um, uh, interview was that 
these things are costly. Speaking up for yes. yourself and for other people are costly. And, um, but they are, um, as it's known, making good trouble. And so um, maybe you'd like to speak to that um, in her, you know, sort of lifetime. Okay, Cleo now, and then Elisa uh, in response to. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, why, uh, what do you think is the role of um, historian of economics and historian of economic thought in um, the invisibilization uh, of um, non-white economists? Um, and do you think this is linked to the type of history that was like, I mean, I'm oriented a bit the question, <laughs> uh, but the type of history that was mainly focused on IDs and great men and, and great treaties and uh, because it strike me as Sadia Alexander was quite famous um, um, as, as a historical character and until the work by Nina Banks um, uh, was also, yeah, um, uh, using the work of um, um, uh, Malvo, there was not so much um, contribution. Um, and so, yeah, how, I would like to hear what you thought on the history of economics as a field uh, and, and um, how they, um, uh, yeah, approach race and, and also gender for that matter. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your questions. Um, let me start with um, the question about consumption. Um, that's really interesting. Um, also, also to bring in this, 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 um, this issue of race, uh, at that time, you have these large research projects, right? Um, uh, you have those in London, uh, Birmingham, England, and you have those in the United States by Edith Abbott and so Sophie Schirmer Breckenridge. And they go out, they go into the neighborhoods, bad neighborhoods mostly, and they do these surveys and they ask people very detailed questions about how do you, where does your income come from? But specifically, how do you spend it? And the idea of, of women economists like Hazel, um, um, Hazel Kirk, Margaret Reed, um, Elizabeth Hoyt, they really are interested in consumption, the process of consumption. And Hazel, Hennes, uh, sorry, Hazel Kirk is rather crit crit critical of neoclassical economists because she said, what, you, what these guys do is mostly price theory. It's not theorizing the process of consumption. And um, Hazel Kerr goes on to, to work on the standard of living, right? How do you measure that? How do you set a standard of decent living, which could the government could use to set a minimum wage, that, that kind of stuff. But um, what I found for the research for my book is indeed that we lost a lot as economics by shying away from bringing in the analysis of the whole process of consumption. Um, and um, um, Hazel Kirk does a good job theorizing that, but of course it's a start. Um, and um, I think that, that the work of, of Sadie Alexander totally fits in this tradition. Um, I did not have that much time, but I looked whether these economists um, refer to the work of Sadie Alexander and I could not find anything. So they refer to research done by the, uh, I think it's the census, of course, but it's specifically the um, Bureau of um, uh, Department of Labor. So, uh, and they have a little bit, but um, um, that, is, that is what I can say at the moment. So she's part of it in our methodology, going out and having these surveys, which was very time intensive. Um, and in England, you also see that uh, Beatrice Webb is involved in that kind of research. Uh, Clara Collette is involved in that kind of research. And this was research on topics that, as far as I can assess it right now, was not addressed that much in the mainstream of economics, right? So this was a tool to bring in knowledge and data that the government could use, and that's what Beatrice Webb says, in order to, to make policy. Right, and it was used to make policy, 
so um, that also comes back in the, in the work of uh, uh, Thomas Leonard, who says, okay, these progressives wanted these data and uh, because they wanted the government regulations and policies. And that makes this whole um, uh, thinking, uh, using of notions of social Darwinism and eugenics are rather problematic. Yes. Okay. There's so that's, also, that's, yeah. There's also a question from Annie Cott in the Q&A. Uh, okay. part of, the first part of which you responded, it says other women wrote on consumption patterns and standard of living in the 1920s or 30s, which you've just been talking about. Hazel curtains on, but could you tell us more about the type of methods that uh, Sadie Alexander was using uh, on consumption uh, patterns and standards of living? Yeah, so she just <laughs> kind of keep it brief. Um, she um, did what we would now call qualitative research. Yes, so she had an extensive um, a, a list of questions and part of the she had a subgroup that she interviewed more in depth. Um, and that was the way to go about it because these data were not available through the census, just no, no way, right? So that was her methodology. Um, and then how she would go about analyzing that, I would, I, 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 you know, you would have to look at, 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 at her material. So I can't go into that much further. Um, I, I think that will have to be the last the question because of time and I thank you very much and I look very much forward to your book on a history of economics which will be coming out in May and now uh, Cleo Chassolari Zegouche talking about the role of economists in the Royal Commission on Equal Pay 1944 to 1946 and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, I just start by apologizing, but because I'm a bit sick, and so I hope I will be clear enough, but I'm, my brain is not um, as it bets best right now. Um, so this paper is um, on the role of British economists who were asked to give testimony uh, to the Royal Commission on Equal Pay uh, right at the end of the Second World War um, in the UK. Uh, it's a project that I started with Annie Cott, which is in, in the room, uh, and that are now um, working, I am now working out in the relation uh, to my work on expertise um, uh, and the relevance of economic knowledge uh, more generally. Um, so I will just start by giving some context um, on uh, why this commission uh, happened. Um, then I will focus a little bit um, on uh, the economist um, argument um, and uh, describe what the position they, they um, have uh, in uh, this report. Um, and then I will uh, try to conclude um, on the relevance of economic expertise in a sort of comparative um, um, uh, approach. Uh, so first part is um, about delaying equal pay uh, by setting up a royal commission. Uh, so that's really uh, the sort of objective, uh, if you want, of the, of the um, commission. Um, so first, what, what is it about? So it's about what uh, was called at the time the woman question, uh, which is um, um, a debate uh, about women's labor, women's wage, but more generally about the role of women in society. Uh, and it's controversy, uh, and here I call uh, Edgeworth, uh, which touched not only the pocket, but the home. Uh, and in the case of this specific um, uh, commission, uh, it, really, it, it really focused on public employment uh, and on the principle, on implementing the principle of equal pay within public employment. Um, and until uh, before the Second World War, you have um, uh, committees and votes uh, in favor of this principle in the civil service and in local government uh, that were actually not um, uh, implemented. Um, okay, sorry, I have, okay. Um, so this question in uh, the particular uh, moment of the war uh, is linked to uh, um, um, the dilution argument, uh, dilution, sorry, um, agreement, uh, which basically, um, relates to uh, the idea that uh, men are not here and there is men's job to be done. Uh, so uh, the jobs need to be diluted or di 
um, uh, decomposed in various uh, type of operation that the woman or other unqualified um, uh, labor can do. Um, and this arg agreement was supposed to uh, make uh, the replacement of men by other type of um, uh, uh, person more easily accepted by trade union, but not, not only. Um, and an, an important debate was about where the job dil diluted change or uh, whether new job created, if there is new job created, is it women's or men's uh, jobs? And so there was a lot of debate about categories. Um, this was very strong in the during the Second World War, uh, especially because there was um, uh, equal pay strikes, uh, and there was already a committee um, uh, uh, set up to um, uh, investigate equal pay for equal work. Uh, Beatrice Webb fa famously wrote a minority report for this um, uh, commission. Uh, but what was really central, uh, and here I just uh, show a, um, a memorandum. I mean just to show a picture because the main information is not here. Uh, equal pay for equal work in the civil service was more consensual than in general um, for general um, um, labor market, uh, but it was seen as a budget issue uh, because if you have to pay the women in the, in the civil service the same, you really have to increase uh, the current budget. And because it was the war and then because it was crisis, you know, we can't afford uh, justice. So this was a bit the context uh, before, uh, during the first, after the First World War, the interwar period. Um, and basically, uh, when you read um, uh, the, the, the archive, uh, you um, um, have this idea that setting up a commission is a way to uh, answer a political demand, uh, but also delay, delaying it uh, uh, and um, as a matter of um, um, uh, politics, because there was more urgent things to do. Um, so it's also a way uh, to answer um, uh, um, the fact that uh, there was a, a, a big mobilization uh, within the Equal Pick um, uh, Campaign Committee that was really taking all the, the, the energy that uh, from the feminist movement uh, that was spent uh, uh, on the enfranchisement and the vote uh, campaign that was um, transferring is um, um, dynamic to um, uh, equal pay. Um, and there was a direct precedent uh, during the Second World War about the fight for equal compensation um, uh, when um, uh, people were uh, wounded. The memorandum you see on so I don't know for you if, if it's on the right too um, it's um, the same idea of uh, uh, so it's from Western Churchill um, and the, the main argument uh, within uh, the government was the idea that they can't afford it uh, which is quite an interesting move from argument about it's not necessary uh, or it's not possible uh, to it's just a budget issue that say something about uh, uh, the conception of um, equality that was uh, a bit moving. Um, so that's uh, the sort of background behind the, the Royal Commission. Um, they they met from not, um, from forty four to forty six. There was a lot of meetings. Um, so Dennis Robertson was professor of political economy at Cambridge. Uh, was in fact uh, the shadow chair of the commission starting in the middle of those um, uh, years. Um, and really importantly, the terms of, of reference of the commission precluded the making of policy recommendation. So they were asked to gather evidence um, and to answer a certain question, but they were not asked what we should do, which is um, um, a bit weird. Um, in the sense of implementation, they were not asked how to um, implement um, uh, this. But nevertheless, the report that was published, which is um, um, a 200 page report, um, said uh, two main conclusion. And I'm saying that now, uh, just in case I don't have the time to finish this presentation. Uh, first, uh, civil servant teachers and local government employees uh, doing the same work uh, as men should receive unequal pay. 
uh, but women in industry should not receive an equal pay uh, to men due to the specific conditions of labor. And of course, the report really described those specificities at, at length. So that's the, the, the context. Um, and so this the, during um, uh, this commission, of course, there was hearings um, and um, um, a lot of people were asked to actually give um, written or oral testimony in front of the commissioners. Um, and uh, the main source I'm using basically is the report uh, from uh, uh, the, the commission. And I'm mostly interested in one of the appendix, which is uh, um, written testimony from economists. Uh, and it's sort of major economists at the time uh, 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 in the sense of like you have Pigou, um, you also have um, um, Anderson, uh, X, but you also have like young and like not established uh, uh, professor. You have um, um, people who are specialist of labor, people who are not specialist of labor at all. You have theorists. You have um, actually very few per, um, economists who did uh, work did empirical analysis of the labor market. Um, so Florence, um, uh, Philip Sargent Florence is one of the only one who actually has produced a paper on the um, uh, statistical analysis of women's wages. Um, and uh, the only other appendix that, that is about asking expert written question that they should, should send to the commission is the medical expert. Um, so the economists were asked three questions uh, and they were asked to answer uh, um, uh, a text, uh, except John Robinson, were headed to the commission very late because someone refused uh, to be part of the com uh, to do that, and she didn't receive the question, so she just wrote her own thing, uh, which is one of the most interesting one. Um, so the three question: the first was uh, given the the current wage differential, why cheaper women's labor is not substituted to men's labor? Um, is it because of convention and pressure? that prevent the substitution, or is it because of the limitation in a number of women available for industrial employment, coupled with the superiority of bargaining power on the part of employers? So here you see the question are not really like yes or no. Uh, they quite oriented and they take a, as given the idea that uh, the main model is like if women are cheaper and uh, equally productive, uh, market forces will um, um, make the substitution and we don't have to worry about equal pay. Uh, the second question is, what would be the economic consequences of equal pay on the employment of women? Will um, it uh, produce um, reduction of employment or uh, will it reduce the prejudice of employers? Um, and in the word of the, of the commissioners is, um, would it provide the reassurance that men's employee will not be undercut and may induce them to relax, um, sorry, to relax the convention and pressure and here they just quoting um i mean i'm i made a mistake it's employees but it's also the prejudice on the employer or i didn't put the quote for some reason um the last question was specific about the teaching profession uh if we do equal pay for equal work in the teaching profession will we have the right right ratio of women and men in the profession because it will be um, there, there was a main fear was over feminization uh, of the profession, um, and um, they do ask the economist about what they think would be the consequences. Um, so to the first question, uh, the majority of economists answer that uh, there was no substitution because uh, the labor market was not perfect um, and there was pressures and conventions that were the first forces uh, to um, uh, prevent the substitutions. Um, Florence is the, the only one, Sergeant Florence is the only one uh, to have this um, um, idea that there is a shortage of women's supply, uh, but for him it's due to conventions uh, uh, and socialization. Um, and for McGregor is uh, interestingly putting um, a sort of self-fulfilling prophecy model in the terms of um, um, short supply of women in certain um, 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 occupation um, and Pigou is like um, talking about the force of competition that would normally work uh, but that doesn't work in the case of women on the labor market because of pressure and convention 
Um, and um, Ross is the only one to be really focused on the natural differences, the biological differences and the inferiority of women uh, that um, um, uh, produce the conventions of treating men and women differently. Uh, X is um, the only one to say that this is first and foremost market forces and there is an, eff an efficiency gap between men and women. Um, and so there is no substitution because uh, men and women uh, cannot do the same uh, work. Um, all mentioned the differential bargaining power as a factor, um, and Pigou and Robinson are the only one to really focus on competition uh, and uh, do their argumentation against um, uh, the idea of um, perfect competition on the labor market. Uh, what would be the consequences of equal pay uh, on the employment of women? Um, it's interesting because um, uh, the some see um, uh, without doubt negative effect on the employment of women without giving any sort of empirical uh, justification for it. Uh, it's more um, theoretical. Um, there is majority, I would say, who see sort of um, not determined uh, effect. Um, and Florence and Wooden uh, really insist that um, equal pay can change conventions. Uh, on the labor market, and um, uh, and this for Wooten, Baba Wooten, depend on the prevailing employer's prejudice. So it could reduce employment uh, if women are thought as inferior, uh, or it could just uh, reduce the fear uh, of um, uh, women undercutting men, uh, because um, uh, yeah, and some didn't answer this question uh, for some reason that I ignore. Um, the consequence on, on teaching, uh, the discussion is um, uh, the, of the third question is where you can see really the um, some idea of the sub sub substantive, I would say, differences between um, uh, conception of uh, what is work. Um, so for most of the economists ask, uh, this will lead to an oversupply of women in the teaching profession because it, it will op open more opportunity for women in this particular profession compared to others. Um, and uh, Pigou, Magrever, and White think that to tackle this issue, uh, uh, because it's uh, really sort of a consensus that we, that we need to have both men and women's teacher, because men uh, uh, can teach boy and women can teach girl, and it's uh, not something that is discussed at all. It's considered as two different type of, um, um, I would say, labor or commodity. Um, and so the solution for Pigou, McGregor and White is to uh, have men's wage superior to attract more men uh, because they will um, not come if they have, because they have more opportunity uh, on in other occupation. Um, and Wooten say we just need quota uh, of men and women uh, if we want the right ratio of them. Uh, Hicks is really insisting on the idea that there is no overlapping areas in teaching, um, uh, no overlapping employment, sorry, um, because of intrinsic difference between a men's and women's role as teacher. And for Hicks, also one of the issues is cost. And for Wooden, it's really um, uh, the main part, yeah, the main uh, problem. Um, I don't know if I have, have the time, but there is more to the, uh, testimony then you have just... four minutes left okay perfect i will go sort of quickly on this um there is more to the to those um uh, testimony as i'm saying here it's really incredible material uh, and actually you could write an article on each of them um what i think is very important is you could see how family welfare and family allowance became central in the question of equal pay here um and many insist on the social function of unequal pay. Um, and, but you do have a strong um, a position, and I think it's the majority um, for different reason, that see social policy or family policy as something that should not be left to the wage system. Uh, and you have uh, a, a lot of example, like a bachelor are not paid less because they have less children. Uh, and, and it's really the moment of transition from um, uh, where many on different side of the controversy are just um, 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 taking into question the, the, the concept of family wage uh, from different point of view. Um, 
there is interesting things on statistical discrimination and prejudice and the role of uh, what people think uh, in setting wage, which is personal interest of me, but I will not go into uh, right now. Right now. Um, and I think Robinson is the only one to really say the argument that, yes, it's a cost issue, it's a budgetary issue, uh, uh, but it doesn't have to be supported by the people who are paid less uh, uh, and by squeezing particular groups of workers. Um, so she's really the only one to say, yeah, justice is not cheap, uh, but uh, the, the, the idea of this cost doesn't have to be um, uh, uh, yeah, the burden of one specific group, in that case, woman uh, teacher. So just a few words on the relevance of uh, this um, uh, testimony. So I always I already told you the conclusion of the report. So this is the report where the commissioner take all this evidence and say, oh, we say that. Uh, there was two decent written uh, by the three women from the commission that were uh, I would say more progressive, uh, and that was led by Janet Bone, uh, who was a medical doctor and who contested the medical expertise that was put in the, um, in the report. Um, and there was a, not a reservation from the more conservative members of the committee who were also um, contesting um, the um, uh, analysis of overstrain and basically saying 20 years ago, um, doctor was saying women cannot work in the same employment as men because they're inferior and that it will overstrain their body uh, so we need to protect them so this cannot change in 20 years so um, we think that the report should not go in that direction um, in those two dissents you really have uh, on both sides the idea to put open opinions and evidence what is interesting is that the sort of economists or people who are not medical experts are um, di disputing the medical um, um, evidence, uh, but Vaughan and all the people are discussing uh, the social the social explanation. Another minute. Yeah, and they're using uh, the econ some part of the economist uh, testimony to um, actually, um, um, yeah, contest um, the um, uh, social science analysis in this. Um, the unexpected consensus is about the idea that at the end, uh, th they do have, um, uh, among the economists for different reasons, the idea that the solution to equal pay will be the granting of family allowance. Uh, and um, you have um, an important uh, development on that, uh, that I could um, maybe just um, uh, develop a bit more uh, in the discussion. So. To conclude, um, I will use a letter sent to the Times that I think for me uh, is a good sum up of this uh, uh, report. Uh, it say that um, it's from the National Union of Women's Teachers. They say that it's a really interesting document, uh, uh, but we all know that since a long time. Uh, so what is actually the contribution of this? It's not really clear. Um, and then I just listed uh, uh, the long uh, road to equal pay. Uh, in the civil service, it took um, um, seven more years. Uh, there was there's still not equal pay for equal work in the, in the private sector for a variety of reasons. Um, and so you have this idea of like uh, repeated argument with no impact uh, 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 or very difficult implementation. Um, my other conclusion is um, basically the relevance of expertise is always contextual. This is really not new and not original. What I find here interesting is like you have uh, general theoretical economists who um, have opinions uh, on equal pay based on theoretical arguments, uh, and you have specialists of labor using evidence. Um, uh, and I think what is um, uh, at stake here is the economist using uh, argument that are beyond economics uh, to uh, make the position here. And in that case, Robertson, who is a commissioner and not an expert, is really using his uh, weight as an economist to uh, go in a certain direction. Uh, what does it say? I think it says something on the changing nature of the economic discourse of women uh, between medical discourse, economic discourse, and um, family or like ethical uh, discourse. And I think it's interesting to look at the transition you could see in conservating, uh, conservative South uh, uh, that actually move uh, uh, 
toward a, a different type of argument, uh, even if it's still against equal pay. So you could see change, uh, like for example, this idea that the, the main opposition is now the cost of it rather than um, um, uh, the inferiority of women. So I will stop here. Thank you very much. Uh, and now uh, time for a bit of the discussion. Uh, please use the raise hand function uh, at the bottom of your uh, screens. Uh, Julia. Yes, thank you so much. It's wonderful. And uh, I was wondering if this, I mean, where we can find all of these documents that are freely available or, I mean, uh, it's a lot of stuff to really go in depth. But I mean, my main question, um, it's about the consequences for, I mean, the teaching professors of uh, equal pay for women. And I saw that uh, uh, there, was, uh, there wasn't the answer by uh, John Robinson. So I was wondering if she um, and took a position in that or I mean, uh, do you have any idea of that? And um, if the, the answer was absent at all. So and then Anne-Marie and then Cleo can respond to both of, of them. Sorry, I didn't get to the answer of Robinson on on the consequences for uh, teaching the professor of having equal pay. Yeah, okay. And Anne-Marie? Cleo, uh, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about more about the testimony that was given by medical experts and um, what you said about um, the uh, sort of commentary back that was by non-medical experts. Mm -hmm. So Cleo, why don't you respond to uh, those two and then we'll have Edith. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I'll start by the second one. Um, and thank you to give me the opportunity to just talk a bit more about that um, because I think I mixed, um, um, I made a mistake in my talk. Um, the medical experts were quite progressive and they were se seeing no um, uh, opposition to the idea that women can work in any type of employment. And that's because they were all, um, um, they were gathered or asked to answer by Janet Vaughan, which was in the, one of the commissioner. And would she um, sort of um, uh, curate those uh, medical uh, expertise? Uh, so there was pages and pages on like the role of um, uh, uh, menstrual cycle on women, um, but uh, and and it's really going in a direction that there is um, maybe some specific arrangement to be made, but it's not. Um, it does. There is no general physical inferiority or no job that women can do, and Asquith, uh, Robertson, and um, Anderson in in the descent are using the testimony of Janet Campbell, which was the women doctor in the previous commission that was saying, no, women can't do the work uh, because of some uh, physical um, um, weakness. Um, and so, and Janet Vaughan wrote a dissent with the other women about the chapter created by uh, Robertson to say, no, I think convention and socialization is much more important. Uh, um, on the labor market that it's said. So you have this sort of um, uh, cross uh, dispute uh, between the more conservative and the more progressist, I would say, even if those category doesn't really work here um, on the question of equal pay. And, and I think it's interesting that mean the medical expertise is moving in a direction, uh, not exactly in the same way. And you could use those different uh, expertise in, yeah, depending on where you want to go. Um, okay. oh, uh, before we go to Edith, I should mention that uh, it appears that only the panelists have the raise hand function on the bottom, uh, so that other people uh, can ask questions through Q&A or chat. But so after Edith has asked a question or made a comment, I'm going to ask if members of the audience who want to speak can unmute themselves and make brief comments, and then Cleo can respond 
to those as a group rather than responding immediately after each. But okay, I can I can wait. I would like to give a preference to the audience. So, if there are any people from the audience who have a question, so, so go ahead. If you're in the audience, uh, unmute yourself. Um, can um, I answer uh, Hugh that question too? Yeah, I will yeah. answer. It. Yeah. Okay. Um, so she don't answer on teaching uh, because she's just. Um, 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 putting a very articulate um, 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 argumentation about uh, the problem is the perfect competition um, uh, model that doesn't work. Um, what I think is interesting in her testimony is like she's not specifically talking about public employment, uh, but she's saying women already have a, nat a natural um, sort of constraint by the, the fact that they are um, uh, bearing children most of the time. Uh, so we should not add to this natural undercapped uh, uh, institutional one. Uh, and so she's on this uh, type of argumentation. Um, whether uh, on the where you can find those. So interestingly, they're not online. I have a copy of this as archives uh, and I want to publish this paper because before I will I, I hope to edit them as like to uh, publish them as primary sources for others to work on. Um, uh, and I don't know exactly when, uh, but I think those could be interesting for people working on Arad, for example, or other economists to use them. Um, so as soon as I'm uh, sending this paper to uh, peer review, I'm making all the sources available for everyone. Okay, thank you. Um, apparently members of the audience can not unmute themselves. So there is a... Uh, Comment from Annie Cott, wonderful analysis of the report, a point briefly addressed in your epilogue, which practical policy consequences or legislative consequences came out of it in uh, the post-World War II years in Great Britain? Mm -hmm. So that's the, um, I, I can research the, uh, the list of things that happened. Um, it, it really, um, right after nothing happened, so that's my point about this was just uh, to delay thing. And there was a lot of other things happening at the time. Uh, what I think is really interesting and that happened right after is the granting of um, uh, family allowance. Um, uh, uh, and that was part of another sort of reform. Uh, and it's something I didn't um, quite emphasize, but uh, in the same time, Anderson, who is also an economist, was a chair of the Royal Commission on Population, and the two commission uh, have a joint meeting uh, right at the end of the of the uh, working on the of the the Commission on Equality, um, and Beveridge also pushed uh, a lot for um, uh, um, the, the the descent of the three women uh, uh, in the press. Uh, so we have this intertwine intertwine history. Uh, between those two questions of population and women's labor. Uh, and I think the, 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 the side of which is concerned with family policy uh, uh, moved more quickly than the equal pay uh, uh, side of the, of, the, of the strategic policy. Thank you very much. And now uh, we'll move on to Julia Zakia and Rebecca gomez Betancourt. Uh, the role of women economists in the social reconstruction of Europe after World War II, uh, the case of the Organization for European Economic Cooperation. Yes, so uh, thank you so much, and I hope you can see my slides. Um, so uh, let me uh, first of all start uh, showing the vision age of uh, pioneers. Uh, uh, of the European Union, uh, those visionary leaders inspiring the creation of Europe, uh, where we live in today. As you can clearly see from uh, the homepage of the Council of Europe, and this is a screenshot that I gave you uh, yesterday, uh, is made up, the pantheon of the Europe is made up of only men, so the so-called founding fathers. So a diverse group of men who have the same ideals, the peaceful, united, and prosperous. Uh, Europe, but can we say that Europe was created without women? So while we cannot deny that, uh, of course, in the end, the European institutions were born particularly thanks to the founding father, it's equally true that the role of women has been undervalued. 
uh, the contribution of women uh, to the European integration in the after Second World War was to be known, valued, and appreciated to broaden, I mean, this pantheon of uh, Europe with female pioneers. And this is the main motivation of our analysis. There is an increasing attention and here we have, I mean, some of the references back and a webinar that you can see also in YouTube to define what women have done for Europe and sorry, for defining what Europe has done for women and what uh, role did women play in the design and the implementations of the European project. Uh, moreover, a small uh, collection of study discusses the role of economists within international and European institutions created after the Second World War. Uh, but to our knowledge, there is still no study on the role of women economists in European institutions in the after Second World War. So our main uh, aim here uh, is to shed some light on uh, the women economists that in the 50s and the 60s gave their contribution for the creation of the European Union through their work in the new born European, let's say, so international institution called the Organization for European Economic uh, Cooperation, the OEEC. And this means to discover a number of untold stories. So our analysis develops on two main stages. First, uh, we study how much women have been neglected in the birth and evolution of institutions. And second, uh, we try to learn more about those women in order to rectify the neglected contributions. Um, the influence of uh, uh, women and inclusions of women in the history of uh, European institutions, of course, uh, challenge the traditional historiographical narratives. And so it has for uh, new methods for different sources, mainly personal sources and interviews. As you can imagine, it is not an easy task to find and to search for this name for the stories of these women who have been lost simply by the heavens due to the culture of the time. So in our work, uh, we use as main references information the archive of the Organization of European Economic Cooperation that has been, has been uh, digital, digitized and is available online on the website of the Historical Archives of the European Union. So thanks to the availability of the minutes of the Council and of all the technical uh, committees, so we have the opportunity to find the few women that participated and work for the birth and evolution of the organizations. And once we discover this name, we focus on three main women economists to analyze their contributions uh, to the work of the institutions and to find the biographies. So in this case, we use interviews, newspaper articles, CVs, unpublished uh, works, and personal uh, diaries. Um, oh, sorry. So why we focus on the OEC? Uh, so, first of all, we decided to uh, devote our attention to these institutions because of its technical character. In fact, it was made up of many technical committees that were responsible for a particular area of economics, food, agriculture, steel, raw materials, machin machineries, chemical productions, but also uh, looking at the main uh, activity and studies about tariffs, national uh, sector of production and consumption for uh, the feasibility of the creation of a custom union or free trade area and multi-realizations of payment. And so let me just say that, uh, and remember that the institution was created in 1948 uh, to allocate and distribute the Marshall Plan ID to the countries of the Western Europe in order to achieve a sound European economy through the economic corporations of all these members. And as you can see from the picture of the time, a women seem completely absent from these institutions. So um, only thanks to uh, the archives, we could identify some key female figures in the OEC um, that gave us the opportunity to identify two main types of contributions by women economists in the 50s and 60s to the institutions. So the role of uh, being a bridge between the political side and the economic side, 
uh, in uh, uh, the person of Miriam Kampf, the first uh, women that you can find in the figure, and then uh, to act as a technical uh, support has uh, techniques. And uh, this is uh, the case of uh, Florence, uh, Curling, and uh, uh, Vera Calpina. That leave the floor to Rebecca. Yeah, so the first character that we found in the archives and uh, trying to uh, uh, put a, 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 na a name and a, and, a, and a photo in this uh, protagonist of the story is Miriam Camp. Actually, she was born in Massachusetts in 1916, and she was the daughter of two uh, academicians, one, Rachel Carolyn Rice, she studied in Boston University, and he, uh, her dad, uh, he, he studied at Harvard, he was professor at MIT, and was like in uh, university in mathematics. What is interesting for us uh, about Miriam Camp, can you pass, please, Julia? is that uh, she, as the two others, as, as we will see, she has a, a, a very international career. She, uh, in, in some of the archives, we found that they, uh, some many, many uh, authors call her the American woman in London, in Paris and Geneva. Uh, she works more than 15 years uh, in uh, the US Department of uh, the State, and in particular in uh, three uh, different departments. The first one uh, was the Department of Price Administration, under the supervision of John Kenneth Galbraith. And then she works on the Board of Economic Warfare and in particular on Latin America. She wanted to go to Quito and one of the colleagues said, as we put in the, in the slide, frightened the, uh, at the idea that a fragile woman could, would prepare to go to Quito, one of her superiors managed to get her a post in London. So they, uh, suggest her to go to the US Embassy in London. And uh, finally, she moved in 1943 as Assistant Secretary for the Economic and Social Affairs, in particular to work with the planning staff and the Bureau of European Affairs. And this Bureau of European Affairs in 1943, 1944, 1945, was known uh, as the place uh, where the finest and most creative thinkers were uh, located where, where they met. And actually, and on this we found in Kindleberg papers and Marjolin memoir, etc. And uh, as, can you pass please, Julia? And yeah, as, um, as Miriam Kam, uh, she said herself in, in, in her, in one in, in the interviews, she said, there were many fathers of the OEEC, but there only one mother and is myself. She said, uh, according to several accounts, uh, Miriam Camp was the woman who invents, who introduced the word integration for the European Union instead of unification. And this was the word that Paul Hoffman used in his speech in um, Paris, in the conference in Paris in 1949, when, when he said, when he talked about the European integration. So she was known as, she was known, yeah, this one. Uh, yeah, there is a problem. She was known as the uh, Miriam's word, integration becomes Miriam's word. Can you pass please? So uh, she has this international network and she traveled a lot. And this is something that we find also in the two other characters. She went to Geneva in 1947. She went to Paris in July 47 to participate in the conference that allows the, the creation of the Commission for European Economic Cooperation. And she was involved in the implementation of the Marshall Plan. As we found in Marjolin memoirs, uh, I put uh, here, I underlined. Uh, Marjolin recalls that Camps, Henry Labuse, and himself uh, had set the drafting committee for the statute of the OEEC. 
So CAMPS was the State Department's specialist for drafting and writing all these treaties for the new European institutions. And her vision on Europe, if we can say very fast, is she, she considered that Britain had made a mistake in delaying, in taking so long the entry to the, uh, to the European uh, organization. She has a pan-European vision, which include Eastern Europe, Europe, and she had also a global view of growth in Europe and reflect on uh, this transatlantic relation. But can you pass, please? Uh, she resigned the State Department in 1954. So during seven years, she stopped working on the State Department because she got married. And this is something very important in our story because she, uh, in, in, in London, when she was working at the embassy, she met uh, this professor at Cambridge University. And uh, as we found in the archives, uh, her patronymic name gained a S at the end. So she changed her last name. And in all the articles and books that she published after 54 camps is with an S, but uh, she lost her job. Uh, she married, uh, so at the time, married women were not allowed to stay in the State Department and marriage to a foreigner, even if it's uh, from a friendly country like Britain, was out of question. So she started, so, so she didn't work anymore on the State Department. She started to work, uh, publish uh, books uh, and articles um, in economics, and she returned to the State Department in 1961. So she was the first woman to be the vice chair of US State Department. So this is something that for Julia and me is very important. It's like, well, all of these publication, all of this uh, very important role at the US State Department and she's still unknown. Um, but, uh, and this is something that it makes the difference with the other two character. Um, she never felt disadvantaged, as we put in the, in the quotation here in the left, being a woman. She remarked, my only difficulty was getting in, was to get part, but she never participated to a women's movement, to a women's association. And this is very peculiar because our three characters are completely different. Uh, she was an economist publishing books in economics, but very different to the second one. Can you pass, please? So the second one is Florence Catherine Kierling. She was also um, a US uh, economist. Um, she is a Midwest uh, woman that works from the very big, from the early career in the Indiana League of Women Voters. And then she was the secretary of the Women's Voter Organization. She was very acting as, uh, active as lobbyist. She was called the lady lobbyist for the State Department, so very political engaged. Can you pass, please? Her contribution uh, in economics, and in particular, when she started the dialogue and, and the travel uh, uh, about the e Europe um, institution, she was part of the National Women's Trade Union, League of America, and this is something. Uh, this is also something very important for Julia and me, because in the United States, you have these women's trade unions, women's voters leagues, women's that uh, we didn't have um, in Europe at the time. So for example, in 1944, uh, she was part of the United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation Administration. Uh, and uh, as um, Miriam Camp, she works for the State Department. She was part of the European uh, Europe, Europe, sorry, aid program in 1947, and she was uh, in particular focused on the reciprocal trade agreements, the Marshall Plan, and the International Trade Organization. In uh, 1915, uh, she support the OEEC framework for negotiation and uh, was completely in favor for the European free trade area on a multi multilateral basis. Can you Five more minutes. Yes, so very fast because uh, we have a, a third character. We compare the three characters in, on the same basis, then international networks, intimate narrative, personals and family story. Uh, Florence Catherine Kierling, she never married, she never had children, but in opposition to Miriam Camps, she was very engaged for women's rights and she was part of several groups. For example, uh, the Bureau of Home Economics, the National Women's Trade Unions, uh, the Women's Homeopathic uh, medical and the woman Jewish. 
And the third character. Yes, I will go through. I mean, the third character, uh, she's Vera Capino. She was Italian. And as the other, she has a uh, she has a uh, economic background. So she graduated in economics, and her main interests were uh, applied economics, statistics, the importance of data collection, something that is related also to the other uh, uh, presentations that we had, and also, of course, to the question of the Italian dualism, so the difference between the south and the north uh, of Italy, the Mezzogiorno questions. Um, so her contributions were considered, I mean, she was a pioneer in applied economics. Uh, she uh, drew up the first ever uh, input output tables for the Italian economy in the 50s. Uh, I mean, considering the regional differences, so looking at which are the distinguished between the north and the south of Italy, but also using these input output models to forecast the effect of the economic policies in Italy and also for, I mean, all uh, the increase in uh, the outcome that were uh, defined by the OECC as a main uh, progress in uh, uh, the evolution of the, uh, of the character. Uh, so let me, uh, sorry about that, I have a problem with my um, I think so, uh, just and then uh, going uh, really quickly, also uh, uh, Leontien himself that used to work with her at the University of Madrid. I remember her as a main colleague that, I mean, could uh, really collegate and, uh, and then uh, find out the true liaison between uh, the theory of the input output tables and the empirical observations of economic class. But I mean, from her own CVs, and here we have, I mean, an uh, extrapolation of her own CV in Italian. We learned that uh, she was um, working in the 50s when she was 40 as an Italian expert for a technical measure organized by the OEC uh, in the United States to study the needs of creation and development of the industrial. Uh, statistics at all levels that she implemented, of course, in Italy, but also in Europe as director of the statistical section of the US, the special representative in Europe that was uh, a base in Paris. So she actively contributed to the OEEC long-term program, producing and collecting uh, reliable statistics on the level of consumption productions in Italy that will be comparable uh, with other uh, member states and it could be used also for the co forecasting of uh, the political effects of policies. Um, so what I want to stress here is that I mean, she never married, but I mean, uh, uh, like uh, Miriam Camps uh, and uh, also uh, Florence Skirling, uh, she used to travel a lot all around Europe, uh, all around the world. I mean, uh, she also uh, had lectures in Cairo, in Yugoslavia. Um, and, but, I mean, as uh, uh, Miriam Camp, uh, we didn't find any evidence of uh, her engagement with women association. And um, once upon a I minute, mean, even if she was well known, appreciated all around, the war by the International Academia we saw and, and the quotation also by Leontief. Uh, she never uh, gained a, a position at the uh, university uh, in Italy and this discrimination of uh, the Italian Academia. Uh, she was referring to, I mean, the main cause here was uh, the fact that uh, she was experiencing innovation uh, in the field of economics, uh, doing applied economics, uh, and not uh, looking at I mean, how male-dominated and patriarchal was uh, the structure of academia in that time. So, so let me wrap, yeah, I would just, I mean, go really uh, fast in the conclusion. So the stories of three, uh, say three uh, important women uh, give us the opportunity to stress how important is the narrative approach and also the use of different sources of information, oral sources, to discover the women economies and their distributions, and both a particular force, the investigations of the connections and networks between these women economies of a particular time to define to, and to define and define the boundaries of the particular networks, marking their interactions and connections. 
uh, and also find and important to find their international networks uh, and their uh, travels that we saw in you know, for all these three uh, women were really important and uh, could help our development bonds with uh, uh, and among the uh, community of economic experts in different countries and uh, international organizations. Let me express also how the professionalization of economic values and hello women to be part of the labor market as technical experts and with uh, um, the end of the work to access in uh, also I mean with a lot of difficulties in the public administration and or in the academia sorry once more um, so finally uh, what we can say uh, for me are camps for and killing and the uh, if we take in consideration the uh, strategy identified by 4j uh, by women economists uh, in the us uh, all the three uh, women didn't follow a segregation strategy but i mean they follow a super performance like in the you know, camps and killing or a innovative strategy in the case of Recapina to emerge and compete with their male colleagues. And that's why we have to remember uh, them. So thank you so much. And this is a work on progress, of course. Uh, we thank hope you. to thank have you. also others. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, panelists, uh, uh, the members of the audience uh, should ask questions in the question and in the Q and A. Uh, and the first, there's a a question from in the Q and A. Do you have any idea about the relations that these three women had one with another? Uh, so if you could respond to that, and then I see Edith has her hand. So. Either Julia or yes. Rebecca. Julia, can you can you share the the last uh, slide uh, uh, of our PowerPoint where we put the uh, main sources for archives? So as Julia said at the beginning, um, we work a lot. Yeah, this one. We work a lot with the um, online archives that are available in the website of the OEEC, but there are also uh, some personal archives that we are um, now uh, trying to trying to have access to. In particular, Florence, because these three women, apart Miriam Camp, that, um, I mean, we have a lot of uh, articles and published book, um, and Vera Kaupina that there is this uh, entry in this fabulous book that you all have. Um, I mean, they are, they're still unknown. So Florence Kirlin archives are at Columbia University and then in the different um, association that she was part of, uh, for example, the uh, trade union, the Women Trades Union label League of America, and, and there are a lot of things also in the in the Library of Congress. And for Miriam Camp, the archives are at in her college in the where she studied. Um, so we are in communication. So we don't know. Is one of the questions that we ask ourselves is like. In particular, Florence Kirlin and Miriam Camp, they probably met because they went to the same conference in Paris and in Geneva, but we don't, until now, we don't know. So we couldn't find, but we we are working on these archives. Thank you. Edith, you have your hand. Hey, you're muted. Uh, yes, yes, okay, thank you. Um, I, I put in a chat a question. Um, all right, your opening question, has the uh, EU been founded as an endeavor by men? I think the answer is yes. <laughs> but um, I'm kind of curious um, how these, these um, last two women who perceived themselves as feminists, they were kind of outspoken about that. If they brought in the discourse about the European Union, their feminist ideas, uh, because later on in the history of the EU, of course, what you see is that the EU has a very strong role in bringing about equal pay, more labor for participation of women in, in, in member states. Um, but what you also see is that these notions are pushed towards the 
they are perceived as social issues and they're moved towards the national level, which means that the economic cooperation of Europe is kind of separated from so-called women's slash social issues. So I'm kind of curious about if, if that comes up, if there's a direction that you're considering going. Thank you. So thank you so much, Amin, for this question. And uh, this is I mean, uh, something that we try also to define. Um, uh, it's the fact that I mean, uh, the OEC uh, was really technical one. We find out, I mean, uh, not so much interest in, uh, let's say, the social Europe. So uh, more, I mean, uh, uh, usually I mean, uh, social context, social identity, language, identity, political, and so on, uh, equal pay uh, for equal rights, I mean, questions. And, and what, I mean, was interesting for us is that, I mean, uh, uh, apart from uh, uh, curling, that, I mean, perceive herself as a real feminist. So, I mean, try also to push for that, uh, even if, I mean, she wasn't really technical, uh, uh, committee on the tariff. So she was speaking about just trade <laughs> and traffic uh, and I mean, goods and services uh, and the frontiers. But um, what we find interesting is that instead, I mean, for example, Vera Kopina, we don't have any evidence of her interest in that uh, definition. But I mean, she was more uh, interested in uh, the mathematical, the statistical. But like, I mean, I don't know if a sort of a different kind of uh, segregation or a different kind of uh, interest of these women that wanted to enter in the male-dominated uh, spheres. But I mean, what we saw is that in the context of square, there were not much interest in the social Europe. And so the concept of economics were, I mean, the more let's say what we call now uh, mainstream economics, uh, they used to have technical role or to act, I mean, as diplomats, uh, looking at the political spheres and the economic much uh, theoretical things. But I mean, of course, I mean, and this is, I mean, the next step of uh, our analysis is to, I mean, not just looking at their role in these institutions, but looking also uh, behind and also after, if they had any interaction among themselves, and this is, I mean, why I was stressing how important it is to look at networks, because we we'll just try to see, even if they spread their different ideas, not technical ones, also around Europe, and uh, if they had any, any inter uh, connections among themselves. So we will, we will see that. <laughs> we hope to find something over there too. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Yes. If I can add just one comment is um, we also want to uh, uh, to find some other women economists in a United Nations institution that was uh, um, the Commission for Europe, the UNICE, because in the UNICE as uh, CEPAL, as the Commission for the Economic uh, for Latin America, there are these uh, affirmative actions. They really need in the chart of the institutions, they put that they need to uh, engage women as experts. So we suppose that we will find uh, other kind of economies or maybe more women that we found in uh, OEEC. So this is something that we have in mind to, to compare and to see if we find another profile. Uh, but in the case, in the case of Florence Kierling, her engagement as feminist was really linked with her ideas for Europe. And she was promoting more and more um, discussion, debates, diversity, et cetera, in, uh, in the institutions. Thank you very much. And uh, I think we now go on to Anne-Marie May uh, from the University of Nebraska at Lincoln presenting a paper that's uh, joint with me on the progress delayed women in the American Economics Association before 1970. Thank you, Bob. Um, while I'm getting set up here, I would also mention, um, as Edith did, that I have a book coming out in June 
and it's with Columbia University Press on gender and the dismal science. So I hope that you will visit their website. I have a blog for, blog for these meetings um, that I put up and uh, uh, feel free to take a look at the description of that particular um, book. So um, the topic of our presentation today is on women and the AEA before 1970. And um, starting with the presence of women at the AEA organizing meeting in 1885, and then going to the formation of CSWEP in 1971. And specifically, we um, talk about publications in scholarly journals, um, book manuscripts, doctorates, um, participation in the annual meeting, participation in the ongoing business of the um, AEA. And we conclude by discussing some institutional factors that have come up today um, a little bit in some of the other presentations, looking at uh, things such as marriage bars and um, anti-nepotism policies. So um, the creation of CSWEP, of course, gave formal recognition to the presence of women in the discipline, but it also brought to the attention of the profession their underrepresentation. Um, but it was significant in the sense that it marked a new era for women in the AEA. Um, however, it's long been noted that women have had involvement in the AEA from the beginning. Um, Catherine Coleman wrote, uh, who was the only woman who attended that first organizing meeting in 1885, also wrote the lead article in the first issue of the American Economic Review. And um, this is a picture of uh, Catherine Coleman, and she also published in AEA publications prior to the AER um, inaugural issue. And it's perhaps maybe surprising that um, William Bomo wrote an article for the AER marking the AEA centenary in 1985, um, but did not seem to notice Coleman's article on the first page of the AER. And although she published in the second issue as well in the AER, it was in the papers and proceedings. And in fact, um, it was eight years before another woman published in an, a non-proceedings article in the AER. So there were other women who um, published uh, in the scholarly journals. Edith Abbott, that has been mentioned before today, um, published 19 JPE articles. Sophonisba Breckenridge had published eight JPE articles. Um, Helen Dendy Bozanquet had published 10 EJ articles in the period from 1886 to 24, and Clara Collette published in the, J, uh, in the QJE and the EJ. Um, want to work. Um, Edith Abbott is pictured here. Um, she was the first woman to serve as a vice president of the American Economic Association in 1918. So, there were other women, such as Agnes um, Wergeland and Anna Pritchett Youngman, um, and they published numer numerous articles in the PJE as well as in the QJE and AER. So in the end, um, when we fly up to 30,000 feet, we see that a total of 36 women published full length meaning non-papers and proceedings articles in the AER in its first 37 years, not an insignificant feat, but nonetheless a relatively small proportion of the 980 articles published in that journal. Um, if we compare that, we can look at the QJE where 32 women um, published in that journal from 1886 to 1948. Um, an even smaller proportion of the 1,534 articles published in that journal. And to us, what is remarkable is the success of these women um, sort of stands out because of their lack of research, at lack of access to research institutions. So instead they were employed, when, they, when employed in academe, they were often found in women's colleges um, that had higher teaching loads, um, so-called missionary pay, 
as well as additional monitoring duties not expected of male colleagues from the same, at those same institutions. So there were, of course, um, some who moved out of academia, such as Catherine Beamant Davis, who went on to uh, work in uh, women's correctional institutions. And um, of course, noteworthy is Emily Green Balk, who was um, a professor of economics and sociology at Wellesley College, and who published in the first series of AEA publications in 1893, and went on to win the Nobel uh, Peace Prize. Um, as however, as I discovered when I was rummaging around the Swarthmore College archives on a visit to see my son, um, this notoriety did not preclude the misspelling of her name by the Nobel Committee in their um, official correspondence. So I took a picture of that so I could remember, remember that one. Um, women also published monographs um, as well as journal articles. So from 1911 to 1948, the majority of authors, both male and female, did not co-author their books. Um, and yet co-authoring, as we might expect, did increase over that time period. But when they did co-author, men overwhelmingly co-authored with other men about 91% of the time, while women co-authored most with uh, men 59% of the time and compared to women 41% uh, of the time. So, you might wonder about marriage and co-authorship. There were several well-known examples of couples, uh, married couples co-authoring together, Beatrice and Sidney Webb, Mary and Charles Bear, um, Gladys and Roy Blakey, Ursula and John Hicks, Carolyn Ware and Gardner Means. Um, and during this period, about 25% of the books written by women that were co-authored with a male co-author were co-authored with a close relative and most typically um, a husband. So turning to doctorates and membership in the AEA um, between 1914 and 1937, the proportion of women among new economics PhDs ranged from a low of 9% in 1936 to a high of close to 20% in 1920. And these figures were higher than the representation of women as members in the AEA. In fact, the only year before World War II when women were at least 10% of membership in the AEA was um, unfortunately 1888. And the proportion of women members in the AEA fell to a low of 2.4% in 1903 and basically stayed below 5% until 1928. So there were few women members in the AEA and fewer than there were even new economics PhDs and fewer women on the program of the AEA meetings then there were AEA members, women AEA members. And before World War II, there were two high points in the share of women at the annual conference. In 1890, um, they represented two out of the 24 participants. And in 1922, they represented three out of 37 participants. The um, largest, um, go back, the largest annual um, meeting was held in 1941. And at that time, uh, there was one woman out of the 109 participants, which was one more than was on the program in 1940. <clears throat> so as Elizabeth Peschel, who received her doctorate in economics from the University of Wisconsin in 1933 acknowledged, um, she put it this way, she said it was always men who had the opportunity to make speeches and give their research at annual, the annual meeting. And awareness of these and other inequalities led her to pursue a career in government service instead of in academe. So um, women such as Edith Abbott, Edith Abbott was the first woman to serve as officer of the AEA, and she served as vice president in 1918, um, serving only for a one-year term. 
Susan Kingsbury was vice president the following year in 1919, also serving only a one year term. And in 1928, jo Jessica Pixoto became a vice president. She too um, only served a one year term. And it was not until Mabel Newcomer that a vice president uh, who became vice president in 1938, that a woman served a full three year term. Um, as a side note, um, Susan Kingsbury became a vice president the year after she sent the letter to a letter to uh, Davis R. Dewey pointing out that he had failed to include Bryn Mawr students in his list of graduate students that was published regularly in the AER. A few months later, Dewey, who was the editor of the AER, wrote to Alan Young, secretary of the AEA, um, suggesting that he invite Bryn Mawr students to become members of the um, AEA. So Abbott, Kingsbury, and um, Pixoto were the only women to serve as vice president before Mabel Newcomer in 1939 and Evelyn Burns in 45. And after, um, after Newcomer and Burns, the next two women to serve as vice president were Barbara Bergman in 1976 and Ann Kruger in 1977. Um, the AEA did not have a uh, woman serve as president until Alice Riblin in 1986. However, Mabel Newcomer came close. Um, the Vassar uh, College website indicates that there was a plan to make her president, uh, which ended when she went on a mission to Germany in um, 1950. And um, Charles Kindleberger mentioned that the association um, had never had a woman or a Southerner or a Canadian as president. Um, and to rectify that, uh, the association put forward Harold Innes of the University of Toronto, uh, who was chosen to be president elect. So in 1971, CSWEP conducted its first census and it found at that time that women were only 6% of economics faculty in US departments in their sample and only 12% of graduate students. In 2020, CSWEP found that women now constituted 25% of faculty and 35% of graduate students. So several factors work to depress the participation of women scholars in the early years, um, lack of access to elite universities and um, lack of access to faculty positions in state universities, as well as the use of marriage bars and um, anti-nepotism policies. Um, many universities instituted marriage bars preventing married women from being hired or if they were already employed, called for their firing once their marriage was discovered. Um, Carolyn Ware, uh, who was married to Gardner Means, was not allowed to fulfill her summer teaching contract at the University of Wyoming when it was discovered that she was married. Um, when national attention was brought to the incident, the university reported that the rule was instituted to, as they put it, spread employment where, not surprisingly, pointed out that the university was an educational institution and not a, quote, work relief organization. <laughs> um, after World War II, marriage bars uh, began to go out of style while anti-nepotism policies expanded, um, limiting the access for women whose husbands were also academics. Um, these laws affected the careers of many women most notably perhaps Margaret Gordon, wife of Robert Aaron Gordon, who received her doctorate from Radcliffe in 1935, but was disqualified from becoming ladder faculty at Berkeley due to these anti-nepotism laws. And finally, the GI Bill, of course, um, supported the training and employment of veterans after World War II, most of whom were women. So just to um, sort of wrap up, um, today, uh, COVID pandemic studies indicate that there's a reduced share of economic working papers written by women, according to The Economist, 
And women still represent only about 25% of faculty in US economics departments with doctoral programs and only 35% of graduate students. So while other so-called STEM fields have made progress toward gender balance in doctorates over the past 10 years, the same is not true for economics. And the proportion of women doctorates in economics remains well below um, the proportion that exists in the geosciences, atmospheric and social and oceanic sciences, um, engineering, physics and astronomy and mathematics and statistics. And of course, even more embarrassing is the gender gap in economics doctorates compared to other social sciences. So there is indeed much work to be done to improve the climate in the dismal science and um, the need for consideration as to why uh, these numbers are still, still remain so low. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Um, panelists use the raise hand the function and uh, others should uh, put questions in, in the Q and A. So uh, Edith and uh, Cleo first. Uh, Edith, your hand was, was uh, okay. right. Um, thank you, Anne-Marie, for, um, I'm really looking forward to reading this book. I think it's wonderful to have this all together and um, to, to get a comprehensive view on, on, on these developments. Um, I kind of am curious, the, the way you discuss the, um, the factors that lead to kind of keeping women out of the economics discipline, you limit yourself to discussing legal Leg legislation like you know marriage legislation and nepotism which is interesting um but you do not mention um like um the um institutional culture so to say you do not mention um discrimination which the CSWAP has written about women's um, feminist economies experience with discrimination in their work sexual harassment and you kind of do not mention the, um, the content of economic research and what is accepted in journals and the whole reference uh, practice. Uh, we kind of, that came up in this, se in, in this uh, session that, you know, uh, that women's work tends to be overlooked in one way or another, whether it's, you know, by misnoming them or, or other ways just overlooking their work. So I was wondering, is, is that maybe you do talk about that in the book or you have, a, you have a reason not to talk about it? We'll respond to that now and then we'll have Cleo and uh, Julia. Okay, just to, just to clarify, our presentation is not um, a summary of the book. I just mentioned that as okay. um, I'm getting ready. And so this is research um, that Robert and I are working on. Um, but, um, you know, the, the blog that I wrote for the AEA that's on the Columbia University webpage um, points out that the marriage bars and the anti-nepotism policies weren't constrained to economics. And so um, they might be used more frequently to deny women access in economics. But the real interesting, um, I think, question is the one that you raise, which has to do with culture and um, the, what makes the culture of economics unique that it's preventing women from entering and discouraging women from getting their doctorates there and then uh, perhaps um, encouraging them to leave once they do. And so um, that I do talk about in the book and um, it is to me one of the more interesting things. And I would just say the abbreviated version of that um, has to do with um, the ethos of perfect competition and the notion, the oftentimes um, tacit assumption that outcomes in labor markets are simply the result of choice. And um, that, that makes it much easier for economists to dismiss these things um, as being institutional in nature um, or reflecting other sorts of bias. Okay, 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 good. Uh, Cleo, 
Cleo, and then Julia. Yeah, it's very uh, a quick question. Uh, where marriage bar like formal, um, and and do you have this idea of like the 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 tradition toward more formal rules because traditional convention didn't uh, is not was not sufficient at a point. So I'll just um, say that um, Claudia Golden's work on marriage bars, I, I found to be very useful in providing a historical framework for them. Um, but what's also interesting is that they were included in um, the Economy Act during the Great Depression. And um, uh, they weren't eliminated, the use of them, um, even though that was originally proposed the policy by Hoover, it was maintained by Roosevelt and not eliminated until well into the Great Depression. And what that did was to provide uh, a signaling mechanism to state and local governments, to institutions of higher education, that these, this approach was legitimate. So it had a rippling effect that's pretty interesting, the marriage bars. Yeah. Julia, and then I've got a question to read out from Annie Park. Yes, just a quick uh, note, I mean, uh, also going in the direction of uh, discriminations uh, for women. And so I was wondering, I mean, if you consider also the social construction of excellence in our uh, economic professions, that is, of course, patriarchal, and it's acting as a main barrier for entering and for proceeding in careers. And I mean, I think that this was the case <laughs> Uh, of the 50s and the 80s and I mean still we are there uh, I, I can tell you uh, being a feminist economist a young one in Italy uh, it's always the concept of excellence and so I was wondering if he if there is I mean a narrative of the social construction of this concept of excellence in economics yeah, that's such a good point. And of course, it becomes exaggerated when you have a, a system where um, it's sort of like, a, a, you know, those in charge get to decide what's considered to be excellence. And so it's a self-replicating um, system that's hard to break into. So yes, there's um, interesting work that's being done in other fields on that. <laughs> And it is included and discussed early on in, in my work. And I, I think it can't be overlooked. It's very, very important. And of course, what it's saying is that you have, one has to realize that um, economists are not just, uh, it's not a meritocracy um, in, in a strict sense. And so there's a lot more going on than just the best ideas um, winning out. It's a, it's a much more subtle process and a much more interesting, but interesting in quotes, interesting process um, that takes place in higher education yeah, and in economics, yeah. Uh, and there's a question from Annie Koth in the, the Q&A panel. Were there some topics specifically worked out by women economists in the early period, like uh, home economics, standards of living, uh, consumption patterns? So, I mean, you should feel free to jump into this as well, but the, you know, diversion of women into home economics um, benefited greatly the development of many of those ideas um, mm -hmm. because they found a place where they could um, develop their- uh, the Hazel Kirk and, and Margaret Hazel Reed Kirk, yeah. and the, you know, yeah. the, the joint, joint appointments in economics and home economics in Iowa and then at, at Chicago and so, uh, so that there were people in the departments of home economics who were doing economics, but, you know, basically, but it, it gave them a uh, an institutional foot in the door. Yeah. Can I add to that? Um, can I add to that, Robert? Sure. Yeah. Um, Kristen Madden has this lovely article, which is a quantitative analysis article from 2002, I guess you, you know what I'm talking about, and in which she uh, gives an overview in which, on which topics women economists um, published. Mm -hmm. And she comes up, this is, I, I, I remember this 
pretty well, is that uh, women economists, of course, um, published in labor economics, right? Uh, they joked, yes, I'm going into labor. And uh, they published on home economics and on gender equality. And these topics were not covered by the then uh, in place GEL code. It was con it was called differently, but it was the code that defined economic discipline. And these topics were not covered. So that was one of the reasons that their work kind of got marginalized or was not counted. Yeah. Uh, momentarily, the uh, recording is going to be stopping, but we can continue. Uh, talking for as, as long as, uh, as as we wish. Well, I'll just I'll just conclude by saying that what is particularly rich for our discipline is the prevalent um, use of the um, competitive model to explain women's absence and that they're just simply not there because they don't want to be there. And the real, um, it, you know, it's kind of striking the ability to be blind to these institutional factors. Well, they're not there because they can't be there <laughs> because there are many laws preventing them. 